It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. Welcome to the It Is Written Canada program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Could it be possible? Could the prayers of a handful of people help someone, even someone on the other side of the world, facing heart surgery? Well, research focusing on the power of prayer in healing has nearly doubled in the past 10 years, says David Larson, president of the National Institute for Healthcare Research, a private, not-for-profit agency. These studies show that religious people tend to live healthier lives. They're less likely to smoke, to drink, to drink and drive. In fact, he says, people who pray tend to get sick less often as separate studies conducted at Duke, Dartmouth, and Yale University show. Some interesting statistics from these studies. Hospitalized people who never attended church have an average stay three times longer than people who attended regularly. Heart patients were 14 times more likely to die following surgery if they did not participate in a religion. Elderly people who never or rarely attended church had a stroke rate double that of people who attended regularly. In Israel, religious people had a 40% lower death rate from cardiovascular disease and cancer. People who are more religious tend to become depressed less often. And when they do become depressed, they recover more quickly from depression. A current study conducted with Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the first to be funded by the National Institute for Healthcare Research involves 80 black women with early stage breast cancer. Half the women will be randomly assigned to participate in a prayer group and will choose eight women in their church to form that group. In the prayer group, the support team will pray for them and she will pray for them. They'll pray for each other. And they will offer each other psychological support and talk about things that are bothering them. And during that six-month trial period, each patient will be monitored for changes in their immune functions. The study goes on to say, nobody's prescribing religion as treatment. That's unethical. You can't tell patients to go to church twice a week. We're advocating that the doctor should learn what the spiritual needs of the patient are and get the pastor to come and give spiritually encouraging reading material. And that's very sensible. A few years ago, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported that cable television mogul Ted Turner criticized fundamentalist Christianity and said Jesus probably would be sick at his stomach over the way his ideas have been twisted. Turner made his remarks at a banquet in Orlando, Florida, where he was given an award by the American Humanist Association for his work on behalf of the environment and of world peace. Uh, Turner said that he had a strict Christian upbringing and at one time considered becoming a missionary but he said he became disenchanted with Christianity after his sister died, despite his prayers. Turner said that the more he strayed from his faith, the better I felt. There are times when the things we want, the one thing we want, is not the one thing we get. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Today, I want to look at what happens when God's answer to prayer is no. 
And there are times we come to God with a request and we're not being picky or demanding. We're just following what the Bible says. Let your request be made known to God. Maybe all you want is an open door or a sign of His will. We would like an answer. And so you pray and you wait and you wait and you pray and no answer. You pray and you wait and you pray and you wait. And then comes God's answer. And what if God says no? What if the request is delayed or denied? When God says no to us, how does that make us feel? How do we respond? Well, let's go back to our story with David. We want to learn from his life and from his experience lessons for our life today. So the ark has made its way triumphantly into Jerusalem. And at long last, the ark was residing safely in Jerusalem. And the nation was going through a period of peace and rest. David sitting on the throne, his days in the wilderness where he was forced to run like a hunted animal were now over. He was at peace and he was enjoying a period of rest. But the wheels of his mind were turning. You see, it was David's purpose to make Jerusalem the religious center of the nation. Well, he had built a palace for himself, and he felt that it was not fitting that the ark of God would reside within a tent. So David was determined to build a temple for the ark, a temple of such magnificence that would express Israel's appreciation of the honor God granted the nation in the abiding presence of Jehovah their king. Therefore, David calls his trusted counselor, the prophet Nathan, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 2. The king said to Nathan, the prophet, See how I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. As David reflected on the contrast between his stately palace and the cloth tent that was the temple, he became convinced of the need to building a dwelling that was fitting for the ark of God. Well, you didn't have to be a prophet to read David's mind. He was formulating a dream to build his Lord the grandest, most spectacular temple in the world. And the prophet assured David that his plan lined up with God's will. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. Well, David's heart was definitely in the right place. His objective was noble. But just because David's heart was in the right place and his friend the prophet was endorsing it did not mean that it was God's will. It's important that we remember that not every plan that we come up with for God is actually of God. Just because we feel that our plan is in harmony with God's plan does not mean that is in fact the case. I mean, just because that from my limited perspective, it seems to make sense, does not mean that from God's infinite universal perspective that in fact it does. Now, Nathan finds out that having David build the temple was not God's will. As noble as David's plan was, it was not God's plan. 1 Chronicles chapter 17, beginning at verse 3. And it came about that same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus says the Lord, You shall not build a house for me to dwell in. Well, I'm not exactly sure that this was the message that Nathan wanted to hear, much less communicate to the king. How would David respond to God's rejection of his plan? Would David understand? David did understand why God did not want him to build the temple. We read about it in 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 8. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood 
and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood on earth before me. God's refusal to accept David's plan to build the temple was not a refusal of David as a faithful servant. God was redirecting David's life plan in a way that neither David nor Nathan could have even imagined. You see, God then speaks to David through the prophet Nathan. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8, 9, and 11. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. You see, it was David's dream to build a temple, and now God was taking that dream away. And I think it's inevitable that David's heart must have sunk, if only for a moment. Now, I came across this poem the other day. It said, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were unanswered. I, among all men, am most richly blessed. God always answers our prayers. He answers with a yes, a no, a wait a while, or something better. In David's case... God responds with something better than building the temple. Verse 12. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever." See, as one door was closed to David, God established with David a covenant that was to last forever. God's loving kindness refers to God's unconditional covenant blessing. God would not stand for disobedience, but God would not remove David or his descendants from their place of favor with him. David's unborn son Solomon, he would be the one responsible for building the temple. You see, typically God's no would cause one to be disappointed to the point that he would not even recognize the tremendous blessing that God had bestowed. Some might even experience some jealousy towards the one who was going to accomplish what he couldn't. But the Bible mentions none of these feelings brewing in David's heart. David was content. David fully trusted in God. John Patton was a great 19th century missionary in the South Pacific. After he graduated from school and ministered in Scotland for a while, he was sent to an island in the South Pacific with his wife. Well, at that time, only cannibals lived in this particular island. When they landed, they didn't speak the language or they didn't know anyone who lived there. All that they knew was that 
the people that had gone there before them had never returned. Well, the threat of their life was hanging over them constantly. At a later time, when the chief of that tribe was saved, he asked John Patton what army protected his place of dwelling in those early months when he first arrived. It seems that God's holy angels apparently became manifest in order to protect the missionary and his wife. After having lived there a few weeks, Patton's wife gave birth to a baby. But the baby died, and a few days later so did his wife. John slept on their graves for three or four nights to keep the natives from digging up their bodies and eating them. In spite of that, he devoted the rest of his life towards ministering in the South Pacific. In the autobiography that he wrote, he, he, he says near the end of his life that he didn't know of one native that hadn't made at least a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He went there with great hopes, lost his cherished wife and baby, and stayed on there alone. But God used him because he was content to do God's will no matter what it cost him. That is what I, it means to aim your life at God's purposes. You know, sometimes we focus so much on the privileges that God has given others that we overlook the priceless inheritance that He has laid in our laps. David did not make that mistake. Overflowing with gratitude, he praised the God who had given him so much. And David expressed his trust through a series of questions. 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 18. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in thine eyes. O Lord God, for thou hast spoken also of the house of thy servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man. O Lord God, and again, what more can David say to thee? For thou knowest thy servant, O Lord God. David could have been disillusioned. He could even have become bitter with God's reply to his request. But David, the man with a heart like God's, trusted God in his infinite wisdom and praised God who had given him so much. And verse 27, For thou, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, has made a revelation to thy servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore thy servant has found courage to pray this prayer to thee. And now, O Lord God, Thou art God, and Thy words are truth, and Thou hast promised this good thing to Thy servant. Now therefore, may it please Thee to bless the house of Thy servant, that it may continue forever before Thee. For Thou, O Lord God, hast spoken, and with Thy blessing may the house of Thy servant be blessed forever. David would spend the rest of his time on the throne gathering building materials for the temple, organizing craftsmen and readying plans for the construction of a temple that he would never build. You see, there was nothing wrong with David's dream to build the temple. His motives were pure. His intentions were pleasing to God. But he was not the right man to carry out God's plan. Has God ever said no to one of your dreams? It can be very discouraging. Sometimes the situation and the circumstances we find ourselves in are almost unbelievable. But we need not get discouraged. It's a funny story about a man approaching a little, little league baseball game one afternoon. He asked a boy in the dugout what the score was. The boy responded, 18 to nothing. We're behind. Wow, said the spectator. I bet you're discouraged. Why should I be discouraged, replied the little boy. We haven't even gotten up the bat yet. You see, when we cannot understand our circumstances, we need to understand our God. At the end of the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17, it says this. 
though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. You know, these words would have meant so much to the people back then, people who were hearing them. They might not mean so much to us today unless we understand the background. You see, though the fig tree not blossom, guess what? Fig trees always blossom. And there be no fruit on the vines. There was always fruit on the vine. Though the yield of the olive should fail, I'll tell you one thing about an olive tree. They last. And the fields produce no food. And the fields, well, they did produce food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold. In other words, if animals stop calving and there aren't any more, there be no cattle in the stalls. In other words, if everything that is common, if everything that is ordinary, if everything that we depend on, if everything suddenly stops, if all of a sudden your entire world is turned upside down in spite of your pleas to God, everything just falls apart. Habakkuk 3.18 says, Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. This is exactly what David did. His dream to build the temple was shattered. His whole world was turned upside down, yet he rejoiced in the Lord. Yet he believed, in spite of the circumstances, that God loved him and cared for him. And at the end of the day, God was going to look after him. How do we get to the point where we have that kind of confidence in God? Well, you only trust someone you know. You know, someone once said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. When you know God, then you can ride out the storms. And when you know the Lord, you will see His love for you even when He says no. I bet you building a temple is probably not one of your secret ambitions. But all of us have dreams. And sometimes those dreams line up with God's will, and sometimes they don't. Broken dreams can shatter a person, but they don't have to. If we believe that God really loves us, really wants what is best for us, if we trust Him with our lives, he will show us His better plan. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we learn to trust in You and in Your love for us so that even when the circumstances do not play out the way we would have liked, we may see it Your way. Bless each viewer today. Be especially close to those who are bringing special requests before your throne right now. Grant them according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone. Do you love desserts like I do? Well, the problem with desserts is that they don't always love us back. Too many sugary, fatty desserts can pack on the pounds, make our faces break out, and overall just clog up our system. Well, today I've got a totally delicious, very easy, and highly nutritious dessert to show you. Carob Avocado Mousse. Sounds delicious, right? For the ingredients, all you'll need is an avocado or two, half a cup of non-dairy milk, a third of a cup of dried dates that have been soaked for 15 minutes to soften them, and three tablespoons of carob powder. 
So I'm just going to put all of that in here. Now, carob powder is a wonderful caffeine-free alternative to chocolate, and it's rich in B vitamins. So I'm putting it all in my high-speed Vitamix blender, and I'm going to blend it all until it's smooth. Oh, see the... The carob is going places. Okay, let's see how this works. You will not believe how good this is, and trust me, it won't even taste like avocado. Here we go. So what you do is you would blend it until it's totally smooth and creamy, and it will be just like a mousse, really, really, Fantastic. See, it comes, it's nice and thick because of the avocado. Now, I adapted the recipe from one I found on the sanaview.com website. It's a really great site that features the story of a teenage girl named Bethany who was paralyzed by a bad reaction to a medication and how the healing power of wholesome food reversed her diagnosis. The first time I tried this mousse, it was love at first bite. So easy, and avocados are so good for us. Yes, they're high in fat, but it's a good, primarily monounsaturated plant-based fat. Plus, a medium-sized avocado has a ton of potassium, is a good source of vitamin C, B6, and magnesium, and has 14 grams of fiber. Fantastic. Definitely try this, and let me know what you think. So here, I'm just gonna scoop some out to show you and see how easy it was to do. And it's got a lovely pudding mousse consistency. And it is so good for you and all of that. And if you just wanna jazz it up a little bit, you can just put some nice raspberries on top. Look at that. Makes it beautiful instantly. Now about the Vitamix, visit their website at vitamix.com for more information about this superb blender. And I hope you'll visit the sanaview.com website to learn more about Bethany and her remarkable story of regained health. I'll see you next time. Well, we've come to the end of another program. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Remember to visit the website, itiswrittencanada.ca. Uh, the website, you can uh, send us prayer requests. Uh, you can make a donation if you feel so impressed to do so. There's also a Watch Live tab. Anytime we're appearing somewhere and if we're streaming it, you'll be able to watch it live on any mobile device. Well, we hope to be back together again next time. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.